Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about some joint work with Ben Watson and Justin Miller. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about models of RCA not star, which um, I've heard mentioned already. And that's going to be my base theory. And talk a little bit about cardinals and ordinals. Okay, so my subject is ordinal suprema, but my theme kind of is um, how cardinality interplays with ordinals in, and by symbol goes on in these models. I'll tell you how to compare ordinals and then talk about suprema in that ordering. The uniqueness and existence is a little bit of a misnomer on the slide. Um, unique existence and uniqueness are part of the definition of, or, of an ordinal suprema. We talk about cases where there is no suprema because there is not a unique Van Walker bound, and cases where there is no suprema because there just doesn't exist any Van Walker bound. Okay, this is probably something you all know. We're talking about reverse mathematics. So we're working in a system of second order arithmetic and calibrating the logical string theorems. The original base theory was RCA, recursive comprehension, which included induction for all formulas. This was very quickly replaced with RCA naught that restricts induction to sigma zero one formulas. And RCA naught star restricts induction even further. We have induction only for double zero. This means that we're not guaranteed that definition by primitive recursion produces functions. And so we add the existence of one such function, namely the exponential function. And the reason we do that is so that we have the tools to code finite sequences or sequences that are finite in the model by elements of the model. This paper by Simpson and Smith in 1986 introduced RCA star and proved some basic facts about it. There's a short section in Simpson's book on RCA not star as well. I think it might be the very last section in the book. And in his book, he says that it would be, and I think his words are, what is interest, an interesting project to redo the second order arithmetic with RCA not stars and basic things that are RCA not. So what I'm gonna be talking about is actually a piece of that project. Like it turns out to be a significant project because not only do you have to look at the things that are at the level of RCA not star to see if they can, RCA not to see if they can be put down, but almost all the reversals I have looked at in RCA not have proofs that do not work in RCA not star. So you have to use special features of models in which sigma zero one induction fails in order to get reversals there. Okay, so key feature of a model of RCA not star in which sigma zero one fails is the existence of sigma zero one definable proper plus in the model. And one of the things Simpson and Smith showed was that models of RCA not star satisfy not only sigma zero one induction, but sigma, sigma zero one delta, sorry, delta zero one induction, but they also satisfy sigma zero one bounding. And that means you have some nice structure around, around sigma zero one definable cuts. Given a cut like that, you can define function F, which is an increasing function from the cut into the model co-final in the model. And both the function and the range of the function are actually elements of the model, although the cut i is not. So this picture, you're going to see this picture several times, you may become bored with this picture, appears in several different ways. You can start with the sigma zero one definable cut i, or you can start with an infinite set x. By infinite, I mean unbounded in the model. And you can find a function that enumerates x in increasing order. 
And if, if the domain of that function is going to be sigma zero one definable cut, it may or may not be the entire model. So you might have a, a proper cut. Or you can start with the idea of, of defining F. If you just have a definition by primitive recursion of an increasing function. Well, Simpson and Smith showed that you can define functions by bounded recursion. And if you leave out the bounded, yeah, but the function you're defining is increasing, the one thing that can go wrong is that you might run out of domain before you run out of range. However, you do, if in this case, get a function that is as a function an element of the model, and again, the range is an element of the model. Okay, so if you've got any set in M, then you have this function that enumerates it. And we can say the domain of that function is the cardinality of the set. This is cheating a little bit because the cardinality of the set might be a proper sigma zero one definable cut, in which case it won't be an element of the model. But it still makes sense to think about these as the cardinals. So because every set has a function that enumerates it, every set has a cardinality, and cardinalities are unique and they behave well. In other words, they, the sets have the same cardinality if and only if there's bijection between them. Set X has cardinality less than or equal to set Y if and only if there's an injection from X into Y. You can take pairwise sums and pairwise products of cardinals. The cardinals are linearly ordered by the natural ordering of cardinals and by um, if you consider a finite cardinal to be equal to the set of smaller things as if you were set theorists, then the cardinals are ordered by inclusion. The strange thing is that there are all these sub-countable infinite cardinals that are interspersed among the finite cardinals. So one of the basic facts that you might expect for cardinality that you don't get is if X is a set of cardinality kappa and lambda is a smaller cardinal, X might not have a subset of cardinality lambda. So if we have a cut that's closed under addition, and just to note, if we had any proper sigma zero one definable cuts, we have lots of them that are closed under addition. Then as a cardinal, this is additively indecomposable. You can't write it as a union of, of, of some of two smaller cardinals. And then you get this fact that I'm going to use is that, so if you have some smaller cardinal, kappa, and you have a set of cardinality mu plus i, and you remove this small set, you still are left with a set of cardinality mu plus i. It's worth noting here that mu plus i is not standing in for any cardinal larger than i. Not all larger cardinals can be written in the form of mu plus i. For instance, some of the larger cardinals are finite, unless if, as long as i is a proper cut and it can break up a finite set into two pieces, you have two finite sets. Okay, so I said that we were working on a piece of the project of trying to redo second order arithmetic over RC and not star. And we decided to look at ordinal arithmetic, partly because there's this very nice survey by Jeffrey Hurst, in which he collects the contents of a dozen different papers about ordinal arithmetic and reverse mathematics a lot of which were written by Jeff himself as well. So first of all, what is an ordinal? An ordinal, again, if you're a set theorist, an ordinal is the canonical representative of a well-ordered well -ordered order type, but we don't necessarily have canonical representatives. So an ordinal is just going to be a well-founded linear ordering. Two ways of defining well-founded. One is there is there is any non-empty subset has at least element. The other is 
you cannot, there is no decreasing function mapping a sigma zero one definable cup into the ordering. In the absence of sigma zero one induction, a number of other things that would be equivalent to well foundedness just are not. So there are well founded order, well founded linear orderings, and linear orderings x with no largest element, so that there is an order reversing function from x into this well founded ordering. And the ordinals are closed under pairwise addition in the natural way of adding order types, putting one followed by the other one. They're not, by the way, closed under pairwise multiplication. Okay, again, working with sigma zero one definable cuts, I said you need to see this picture a lot. We can map I onto a set X that's whole final in M. And then we can take X under the normal ordering, the usual ordering of numbers, and view X itself as an ordinal. So this is an ordinal order type I. So although I is not an ordinal because it's not, it's not an element of the model, we can kind of think of it as an ordinal and use I to produce some examples and counterexamples. So if I is closed under addition, this is an additively indecomposable ordinal. And indecomposable can be defined in a number of different ways. Here we have the strongest. Well, maybe not the strongest, but it's a very strong notion of decomposability, namely any non trivial finite final segment of alpha sub i is isomorphic to alpha sub i itself. Okay, if we're going to have supremo, we need an ordering. And this is the weak ordering on ordinals. So we say alpha is less than or equal to beta if there's an order preserving embedding from alpha into beta. There's also a strong ordering, which requires alpha to be embedded onto an initial segment of beta. And things look a fair amount different from the strong and the weak embedding in some, in some contexts. But I'm only going to be talking about the weak embed, the weak ordering in this entire talk. So when I say less than, I mean less than in the weak ordering sex. And we say alpha is strictly less than beta if alpha plus one is less than or equal to beta. In the weak ordering, this is equivalent to saying that alpha can be embedded onto a proper initial so into a proper initial segment beta. The first theorem relating cardinality and ordinal ordinality. If you have two ordinals, alpha and beta, and alpha has strictly strictly smaller cardinality, then alpha is strictly less than beta in the ordering compared to ordinal. So any ordinal can be embedded into any other ordinal of larger cardinality. So it's a pretty, uh, one of the things that appears in um, first survey as in fact, one part of a nine part theorem of one of the dozens of theorems in the, in, the, in the survey, the theorem of Harvey Friedman and Jeffers that all ordinals are comparable is equivalent to ATR naught. And in order to show that RCA naught star, which hold as the base theory, it's sufficient to show that if you have RCA naught star holds an RCA naught doesn't, then there are incomparable results. The reason being that if RCA naught holds, then Friedman Hirsch theorem applies, and if RCA naught fails, then both APR naught and all ordinals are comparable. Fails, so they're also. So I'm just restating the theorem. We have two incomparable ordinals. And I'm going to go through a proof of this before I get to ordinal suprema as an example of the way cardinality works you're using in these proofs. So we're going to start with an indecomposable proper sigma zero one cut. 
so closed under addition. So it has this property that if you subtract smaller sets, you kind of change the cardinality. And let B be a number that bounds that up. So I is less than B as a cardinal. And now our ordinals are going to be alpha sub I. Remember, alpha sub I is the ordinal that the same order type as I plus B and B plus alpha sub I. So here's the picture. On top is alpha. It's a copy of I followed by a copy of E. And below is beta. It's a copy of E followed by a copy of I. And we want to show that they're not comparable. So let's suppose they are. Suppose there is an embedding from alpha into beta. Looks something like that. And I want to look at the part of the copy of B in alpha that embeds into the part, a part of the copy of B in beta. Okay, so first of all, as cardinals, B is greater than I. So that copy of B in alpha can't possibly embed into the copy of I in beta. So some piece of it does embed. And because B is just finite, and in the sense of the model, it has a least element, and that least element finds a segment of the copy of P below. So, on, at the beginning of alpha, we have something cardinality I, and it's embedding in, embedded into an initial piece of B, and that initial piece of B is a fine, final segment with determined by a top element. So it's finite. So it has some finite cardinality. Therefore, its cardinality is not I. Its cardinality is not less than I because I embeds in it, so it has cardinality greater than I. So now what's left, the part, part of B that that middle segment embeds into has cardinality B minus A. And so the piece that embeds into it has cardinality no bigger than B minus A. So we've removed from B something of size at most B minus A. So we're left with something of size at least A, which is greater than I. And we're trying to embed that into the final segment of beta that has cardinality I. And you can't do that, right? That's a contradiction. Or I've been watching a lot of basketball. The way they say it in the high school basketball games is, you can't do that. <laughs> so that tells alpha doesn't embed into beta. And the proof that beta doesn't embed in alpha is exactly the same, except with the with the eyes in different places. Questions about anything so far? Okay, so now we're going to talk about Suprema. And in particular, we're going to look at supreme of well-ordered sequences of ordinals, because that was the theorem we were starting with. You can equally well talk about supreme of, of families of ordinals. And so an upper bound is an upper bound in the less than ordering. Um, minimal upper bound is an ordinal that's an upper bound, but no proper initial segment is an upper bound. And the supremum is a unique minimal upper bound, unique up dice surface. So Jeff Hurst showed that over RC naught, APR naught is equivalent to the statement every well ordered sequence of ordinances. And what we would like to do is show that RCA naught star suffices as a base theory here. And again, what we're going to do is show that if we have RCA not holds, but RCA not fails and RCA not star holds, then there's a well ordered sequence of ordinals with no supremo. As I said, when you're doing these reversals in RCA not star, usually you can't use the proof that worked in RCA not. Usually you have to take advantage of special features of models in which sigma zero one and does and fails. And that means you're usually getting more nuance than just the reversal. So one thing that sometimes comes out is you get weak forms of your thing that's equivalent to say A, P, R, not. They're actually equivalent to I, sigma, zero, one. Or 
the failure of I sigma zero one is equivalent to a very strong failure of the theorem. Something else that comes, something sometimes comes out is um, classifications or characterizations of which numbers bound sigma zero one cuts in terms of whatever theorem you're looking at. So we're looking not only to um, show the RC not star rule suffices the base theory, but to find an equivalence with sigma zero one induction. So when we're talking about Suprema, we're talking about a minimal, minimal upper bounds. We know something about their cardinality. We know if gamma has strictly larger cardinality than everything in the sequence, then everything in the sequence will embed it in. And it's also the case that gamma is too big to be minimal. That you could cut it off as something of large enough smaller cardinality and you would still have a, an upper bound. So that the minimal upper bound, if there is one, you know what its cardinality has to be. It has to be the upper, the least upper bound of the cardinals, cardinalities of the ordinals of the sequence. It takes maybe a little work to convince yourself that there has to be such a least upper bound. I mean, the, car the cardinal cardinalities are going to determine some cut in the model and a little bit of the thought about how finite cardinals intersperse with the infinite one says it's going to determine the sigma zero one final cut. So there is a, a cardinal that's the candidate for the cardinality of minimal upper bound. Now, again, if that minimal upper bound is actually not realized, everything in the sequence has smaller cardinality. Then kappa, which is the minimal upper bound in terms of cardinality, then in order for gamma to be an, a minimal upper bound of the sequence, it has to be cardinal, have cardinality kappa. It can't have any initial segment, proper initial segment of cardinality kappa, because everything in the sequence has strictly smaller cardinality, so it embeds everything in cardinality kappa. So we can characterize what the minimal upper bounds are in that case. They're ordinals whose cardinal is kappa, and every proper initial segment has smaller cardinality. So if we look in particular at the sequence of numbers, the minimal upper bound for the cardinal is going to be omega, omega in the sense of the model. And that means in order to be minimal upper bound for that sequence, an ordinal has to have cardinality omega m, the size of the model. In other words, it has to be countable. And every initial segment has to have smaller cardinality, has to be subcountable. Okay, so the first thing we did was you know, look at sequences of finite ordinals because the special, the strengthenings or weakenings of theorems that turn out to be equivalent to zero sigma zero one induction often turned out to involve finite sets. And what you get, if you think about it a little bit, is that ACA naught is equivalent to every well-ordered sequence of finite or knows it's a supremum, or to the sequence of N has a supremum. And the reason is that if ACA if ACA not holds, then any countable ordinal, all of whose initial segments are subcountable, is isomorphic. Well, maybe, oh, maybe you can define an isomorphism arithmetically. And if ACA not fails, then you can build something that has um, is countable. All the initial segments are subcountable, but it's not computably isomorphic to omega. Basically, you can code the jump by putting the odd numbers in among the numbers in an appropriate way. And you can do that over a stain on star as well. It turns out a little bit differently. If you're working in RCA naught, what you're actually producing is an ordering that is definably isomorphic to omega, but not computably isomorphic to omega. If sigma zero one induction fails, you might not be doing that. 
you might be producing ordering that's not isomorphic to omega at all. It has the property that it has thought it's countable, all its initial segments are subcountable, but some of its initial segments look like they have cuts in them. So this is enough to show that if an RCA not star, if signature one induction fails, then yes, there is this well-ordered sequence of ordinals that doesn't have a supremum. So RCA not star will suffice as the base theory for a first theorem. But it doesn't give us something that's equivalent to signature one induction. It gives us something that's too strong. So next try there is, well, let's look at finite sequences of finite ordinals. And well, that doesn't get us down to sigma zero one induction either. That gets us down to sigma, sigma zero two bonding. And the idea behind reversal there is first showed that sigma zero two bonding is equivalent to the infinite pigeonhole principle. And that, that works over R day on star too. And so what you have is finitely many color classes, each one of them finite, but the size is using up the entire model. So if you look at the sequence of color classes, each color class itself is a finite ordinal, it's a finite sequence because we're only finite in any color. And we're once again in the situation where a minimal upper bound is going to be a countable yeah. ordinal, all of the initial sands are subfinable. One more refinement gets us down to something that's equivalent to sigma zero one induction. Every finite length sequence of finite ordinals whose sizes have a finite upper bound has a supremum. It's equivalent to zero sigma zero one induction. And the idea going backwards, suppose sigma zero one induction fails, then we've got a cut. And what I want to do is I want to put together the set of n such that n is in the, the sequence of n such that n is in the cut. I can't do that exactly because that's not a set in the model. That doesn't have a delta zero one definition, but you can mess around a little bit, take something larger than the cut and put together a sequence that non-uniformly, if k is in the cut, will have a copy of k and if k is not in the cut, will be zero. And then the supreme is going to be an ordinal of cardinality i, the cardinality of the cut, all of whose initial segments have smaller cardinality. And as long as i is not a minimal cut, there are i is one such thing, and j plus i, where j is a smaller cut, is another such thing. Okay, this is the third we were starting with. APR naught is equivalent to every well ordered sequence of ordinals with the supremum. And first proof here, as well as the three easy proofs I just outlined for you, all negate the existence of having a supremum by having multiple minimal upper bounds. It turns out if you have a failure of sigma zero one induction, you can put together a sequence of ordinals that actually has no minimal upper bound whatsoever. And in fact, a finite sequence of Okay, and the rest of my time, I'm going to sort of outline this proof and you know, draw another picture and probably end early. Leave, leave enough time for questions. Okay, so we're going to start with, an, again, an indecomposable proper sigma zero one definable cut and two numbers that are larger than cut E and D. They don't have to be different numbers. I'm making them different just spin with what they're used for. And we're going to take, we're going to define our ordinals this way. We start out with 2D times D, which we think of as 2D many copies of D, which leaves, including the beginning and the end, 2D plus one many gaps between those blocks. And each of our beta is going to be by okay, putting a copy of I in exactly one of those gaps. So all these ordinals have the same size. 
there are two D B because there's two D many copies of B plus I. And so a minimal upper bound is going to have to have that same size. But what we're going to show is that there can't be minimal upper bound by assuming assuming there is getting a contradiction. And the contradiction we're going to get is to having any upper bound at all of that size, any ordinal of that size that's an upper bound to the sequence. So first of all, assume gamma is a minimal upper bound. So it's an upper bound of size 2db plus i. So it's bigger than 2db. So there are there is an embedding of 2db into gamma. So we'll pick one and use that to break gamma up into 2db many blocks. Basically, the images of the blocks here with whatever come with whatever is interspersed between them. So each each one of those blocks contains the image of a block of size b. So it has size at least b. And the, the set of things that are not in the range is size i. So there are most i many other things that could be in any one of those in any one of those intervals. So each interval has size someplace between b and triple size. There's not, nothing stopping one of them from having size exactly b, but not two of them together. So what we're going to show is any two of those intervals you need together as size db plus i. Sorry, 2b plus i. It has size at least 2b, at most 2b plus i. Let me show it has the largest possible size. I'm looking at the gap between, between the union of xn and xn plus 1, the n and the n plus first interval. And I'm going to embed the ordinal in my sequence that has a copy of i just between the n block and the n plus first block. So we have the picture you see up there. There are n many copies of b, which I call p many plus one more, plus a copy of i, plus b plus 2db minus n, a copy of b, and q more copies of b. And they're embedded into this 2db many intervals in gamma. I'm going to look at what goes into the xn union xn plus one. So first of all, we, we, we know those intervals are not too big. Their sizes are that plus i at most. So that first pb may or may not embed into those, that, those, the first n many intervals of pb, but may or may not embed into the first b many intervals. Or there might be something left over. That second co first copy of b might have something that goes into that segment, but not too much. Or you can't embed all the, the first blue section plus the red section into the first blue section because the cardinality is too big. And the same thing at the other side. So those pieces that are embedded into the first collection of intervals or the last collection of intervals aren't too big. They have sizes with like sizes A and C. And now that PB plus A is embedded into something of size PB plus I, A can't be bigger than I, but A is finite. We're still looking at an interval in a finite set. So A can't be bigger than I, then A is smaller than I. And the same thing on the other side. C is going to have to be smaller than I. So that means most of that red plus green plus red section is going to embed into the red section below. It has started out with size 2b plus i. We removed something of size a plus c. And the rest of it has to embed in that x and in xn plus 1. 
Well, that A plus C root we removed, A is smaller than I, C is smaller than I, I is indecomposable, A plus C is smaller than I. And again, this is if we remove something of small cardinality from something cardinality mu plus I, we haven't changed cardinality. So we have something of size 2B plus I embedded into something of size at most 2B plus I. So that red part and bottom has to have size 2B plus I. Okay, so it's Okay, so we've taken our gamma, which is supposed to be a, an upper bound for a sequence of size exactly 2D dB plus I. We've broken it up into 2D many intervals, and any two adjacent intervals union have size 2D plus I. Well, now we can just clump them together, take the first two and the second two and the third two, et cetera. And now we have D many intervals. Every single one of them has size 2D plus I. Well, there are more than I many of them. Literally, what you can do is if something has size at least 2D plus I, then it has a finite subset of size 2D plus 1. And we can computably take find the least finite subset of that size for every one of these intervals and take their union. And then we get something of size 2DB. I've got some mystery, 2DB plus P. That's contained in gamma. And gamma is size 2D B plus I, which is smaller. And that's a contradiction. So that means this question. So this is a new phenomenon that I, we that had that we hadn't seen before in anything we had looked at at least. A, a model with a sequence of ordinals, well-ordered sequence of ordinals with no minimal upper bound. So how strong is the statement that every well-ordered sequence of ordinals has a minimal upper, has a minimal upper bound? It's at least as strong as sigma zero one reduction, and at most as strong as APR not, and that's about what I can tell you. I'll just mention a little bit that if you look at all of this with respect to the strong embedding, first of all, it's really easy to find sequences of strong of, of ordinals that in the strong sense have no minimal upper bound. In fact, no minimal upper bound of whatever. Because if you have two ordinals and they have any upper bound, then one embeds onto one initial segment, the other embeds onto some other initial segment. That means they're comparable themselves in the strong order. And it was a theorem stated by Harvey Friedman and pr proof given in Simpson's book that the existed, the, all ordinals are strongly comparable as equivalent to ATR naught. So anytime ATR naught fails, there are sequences of link two of ordinals that are not strongly comparable, therefore have. No supreme because they have no minimal upper bound because they have no upper bound. If you look at the things that I was talking about earlier, the equivalences with ACA not and with um, D sigma zero two, well, in the weak ordering, to be an, an upper bound, say the sequence of N, you have to be countable. And every proper initial segment has to be so common. To be a supremum in the sense of this, to be a minimal upper bound in the sense of the strong ordering, you have to be countable. And every initial segment has to be finite. And those are different things from sigma zero when induction fails. So those, those two equivalences with ACA and with sigma two induction that I stated over our seeing on star, if you replace weak ordering with strong ordering, you get equivalences over our seeing off. And I don't know what happens over our seeing off star for those. So that is what I have to say. Okay, these are the two um, papers I cited. 
the Simpson and Smith one, which you should read if you want to know about RCA not star, and the Hearst survey of with the one and all about ordinal arithmetic and reverse mathematics. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you everybody for listening.